Scotland. You know it's home, you know it's beautiful, but do you ever wonder who actually owns it? We're not short of space in Scotland, but just 432 individuals own half of all the privately held land in the country. I want to meet the people behind those numbers. I'm going on a journey. It'll take me around Scotland. I'll visit beautiful places and meet powerful people. The multi-millionaire property tycoon dressed in tweed. The man whose family owns some of our most spectacular lochs and mountains. And the laird whose family marched with Wallace and Bruce, who's up to his oxters in mud. This is a story which matters to all of us. It's a story about who owns Scotland in the past and who should own it in the future. If we don't see a fair distribution of land, then, then we're Parliament. We will have failed the people of Scotland. It may not be fair, but I mean, is it fair that your wife is prettier than mine? If someone doesn't have the bank balance to be able to buy it, maybe that is unfair, but that's the way life is. I have thousands of miles ahead of me. My quest to meet the men who own so much of Scotland. The question is, do they want to meet me? I'll let you into a secret, they aren't all keen. But here in Wester Ross, I've struck lucky. In these parts, there's one chap who knows more about this stuff than anyone else. And he's agreed to get on his bike and help. Morning, John. Morning. How Good are morning. you today? And a, and a nice morning it is too. I wasn't expecting a traditional Highland layer to arrive dressed quite like this. I was expecting tweeds. Bad luck. <laughs> John Mackenzie owns 53,000 acres. His family was given this land by James IV in the 15th century in recognition of loyal service. Being close to the source of power pays, but these days it's renewable energy rather than royal patronage which helps balance the books. John's new hydro scheme here has an added bonus, heartbreakingly beautiful views over the sea to sky. John, there's one thing sitting here which I just can't get my head around and, and that is this. What does it feel like to know that you own all of that? <laughs> it may seem odd, the, the notion that's mine doesn't really occur very often. It's always been in my family. Yeah, I'm very proud of it and, and, and delighted that it's still in one piece, um, that it's passing on. I mean, I'm pretty much redundant now anyway. My son is, is in charge and um, he's taking over, so we continue another generation. Um, and so it goes on? Well, so it goes on at the moment, but un under today's political pressure, <laughs> we'll see. Whether we'll do another 500 years, I'm not entirely certain, but I won't be around, so it's, I don't care. Go west and you'll discover John's land is a classic Highland sporting estate, created to provide deer to shoot and salmon to fish. But John also owns thousands of acres further east. In these fertile fields, Farming is the name of the game. One family, tens of thousands of acres. He's one of the 432 people who own half of Scotland's privately owned land. Is it fair that so few people own so much of our country in the 21st century? Is fairness really a critical element in life? Um, it may not be fair, but I mean, is it fair that your wife is prettier than mine? Um, that you win the lottery when I don't. Um, I, uh, it's a concern stirred up, as far as I can see, by those with axes to grind. But frankly, the people who live in these kind of air, large areas in single ownership doesn't seem to bother them. It sounds like you're saying to me, life's not fair, get over it. <laughs> that would perfectly fair, yes, 
that's, that's how it is. I don't think fairness is of itself um, necessarily a terribly critical thing. John may not think fairness is an issue, but many other people do, and some of them are determined to do something about it. If we were starting from scratch, I doubt anyone would design a system where you ended up with only 432 people owning half the private land. I mean, there's some, obviously, degree of doubt about the, the actual figures, but, but let's take it as a given that is the accurate figure. Um, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't design a system where you ended up with such a concentration in wealth and ownership in such a small group. Fundamentally, is the system we have here in Scotland fair or unfair? I think there are still unfairnesses uh, in the system. Uh, I think that's uh, a fair comment um, to make. And that's why we are on a journey in, in this particular parliamentary session to try and deliver radical reform. Our current system of land ownership has deep historical roots. Land has always been intertwined with privilege and power. And the thing that makes Scotland distinctive is the dominance of sporting estates. Even today, around a quarter of the country is still devoted primarily to shooting, hunting and fishing. The league table of big landowners includes the government, the National Trust for Scotland and even the RSPB. But traditional estates still hold five of the top ten places, with the Duke of Buccleuch estates leading the pack. I wanted to speak to one of the really big traditional landowners, maybe even a duke. But despite trying pretty hard, none of them wanted to talk to me. This is the man who fights their corner, and his time is often spent staving off the blows of land reformers. Are landowners being demonised? I think landowners, to an extent, are being demonised. Fundamentally, is the argument that life isn't fair. One big landowner said to me, my wife may be more beautiful than his wife. We've simply got to get over that. Well, as I said earlier, there's an open property market there. There are estates, small bits of forest, bits of land for sale every day. They're there for everyone to take the opportunity. If someone doesn't have the bank balance to be able to buy it, maybe that is unfair. But that's the way life is. Ayrshire has changed a lot since I grew up here. Today I've come home to meet another local boy. We have a lot in common. We're about the same age. But while my earliest years were spent in a bungalow, his were spent in a walloping great castle. Simon Crawford and his family own 600 acres in Ayrshire, it's a relatively small estate, but the family has played a big part in Scotland's history. Their reward, land and that castle. It's not bad living in a castle, but there's always the concern about what's going to go wrong next. And the repair bills in a building this size are not inconsequential, so uh, it's, that can be quite a, a worry sometimes, yes. This isn't Downton Abbey, is it? <laughs> no, I don't think it is Downton Abbey. Uh, it's a little bit more like real life. Uh, but there's, it, I like doing it, that's why I do it. But I don't do it because I'm making lots of money doing it. This is a semi-detached castle. Simon and his family live in one half. The other is let as holiday accommodation. Simon's ancestors, friends of kings, would never have suspected their home would one day have to accept paying guests. But that's the reality. We were with Wallace at uh, his time. Uh, the family and Wallace's mother are, were close relations. We were at Bannockburn, we were at Flodden. It sounds as if the family have always been a part of Scottish history, like a, a line of thread running through the, the tartan of Scotland's history. It's a good way, it's a lovely way of putting it. Yes, we, we've been there uh, at all the major points in time, I think. Where do you want to break history? Simon works hard and he thinks his family is well placed to go on. There's a trout fishery to run. The servants' quarters are now a boarding kennel. He'll even sell you a cardboard coffin 
if you want to be laid to rest in Crawfordland's environmentally friendly burial ground. My time here is almost over, but the dirty jobs keep on coming for Simon. He's putting on his waders, but this laird's not going fly fishing. Simon has some heavy duty cleaning to do, preparing for a mud race. People come from all over central Scotland to run through your mud, don't they? They do, yes. And spend good money along the way? Yes, it's another revenue stream for us. Horrible things in there. And quite repulsive. Think of a traditional Scottish landowner and the chances are you won't think of someone like Simon. But his family have been here since 1245 and there are those who would argue people like Simon shouldn't be able to inherit an estate like this one. I have to say, after seeing just how hard he's worked through the course of today, I'm asking myself, why not? This debate isn't just about who owns the land, it's also about what big landowners do with it. Those lucky enough to own tens of thousands of acres have huge influence on the land and the people who live on it, and how they use that influence can be crucial. I've left the southwest behind and travelled to one of the wildest corners of the northeast. This is the Cabrach and Glenfiddich estate. It's remote, it's beautiful, but the local councillor here warns the community is in crisis. I represent a very large rural area and this is probably the, the one at the, uh, the furthest edges of decline. What could this place look like in the future if you don't achieve the kind of changes you want to see? Well, the few houses that are left will, will be gone and, and unoccupied. There just will be nobody here but sheep uh, and maybe a few grouse and, and that's about it. This glen has lost three quarters of its population over the last century. For the last 35 years, the landowner here has been Christopher Moran. He's a wealthy, self-made man worth £264 million, according to the Sunday Times Rich List. And he's another of the 432 landowners who own half the privately held land in Scotland. He's a noted philanthropist, but he was also the first man to be banned from Lloyds of London. Mr Moran is usually very keen to protect his privacy, but today he's agreed to be interviewed for the first time about his running of the estate. First of all, I couldn't resist asking if he really was worth more than a quarter of a billion pounds. Uh, perhaps those figures are true, perhaps they're not. Um, I really don't pay much attention to it. Why did you choose to, to come here, buy land and invest in this community? I walked pretty well every hill in Scotland, north, south, east and west, um, uh, and as a young man, and love Scotland, I love the highlands. Things here at the Cabrach have been in decline since the start of the 20th century. What was a thriving community has seen its population ebb away. I want to know, has Christopher Moran done enough for the people who live on his land? There is so much that a landowner can do just by being here and, and the sort of efforts that he puts into the surrounding estate and the community, the jobs, the housing that can be provided here. Um, I'm afraid we're just not getting any of that support. And we could rebuild this community. There are lots of rural areas that have, with the right landowner and their support, have, have been able to bring themselves back to life. And uh, I'm afraid this is just not happening here. But is it fair or realistic to expect a single landowner to resolve a century's worth of decline? One of Christopher Moran's tenant farmers told me the answer is no. 
My experience is I've never had any problems with them at all. It's, it's inevitable what's happened is going to happen. It was going to happen anyway. It's a... Does the Laird always get the blame? Basically, yes, I would say yes. Yes. The estate is littered with abandoned houses. What it needs are homes and people. Mr Moran's answer is a wind farm. The neighbours have already built one. He's spent years battling opposition to his plans. Now they've got the green light. The scheme should make him even richer. But it'll also provide enough cash to refurbish local houses and build new affordable homes. The reality for the community here is it's Mr Moran's vision or nothing. Is it right that someone with your financial backing can come to a community like this, buy the land and exert so much influence over the community? Well, you see, I would, I would put it back to you the other way around, that if you don't have landowners such as myself who are thinking about the regeneration, the sustainable regeneration, of these types of estate. Remember, this is 1,100 feet over sea level. The type of conditions that we ex have to experience in the winter are extreme. So the sort of investment that's necessary to bring about sustainable regeneration is substantial. If you end up splitting up estates like this, where is that type of investment going to come from? Where are the running losses of estates like this going to come from over many, many, many decades? It's time to head south again, but something's troubling me. The message I'm getting from landowners, large and small, is that owning land doesn't make you rich. In fact, operating an estate has sounded like a kind of public service provided by benefactors with deep pockets. But is that the whole story? We asked the leading rural estate agents, Knight Frank, to pull together some numbers for us, and they show investing in land is a very lucrative proposition indeed. Money invested in land performed four times better than the stock market over the last 10 years. That's almost as good as gold. And agricultural land, unlike most property, isn't itself taxed. Profits from any activity on the land are, and taxes are paid when land is sold or transferred. But exemptions mean taxes on sale or transfer often don't apply, which leads to some very odd quirks. Anders Holch Poulsen, a Danish multimillionaire, is now Scotland's second largest private landowner. He owns 160,000 acres. Danish nationals pay tax on all the land they own, regardless of where it is. That means Anders Holch Poulsen is paying a tax on his land and property in Scotland to the Danish government. Put another way, tax revenue raised here is paying for schools and hospitals in Denmark. What it does is it exposes the fact that we've never really properly thought about how we govern land, how land is owned, who owns it, how we should tax it. We've never thought about that in a coherent way. You know, land in Britain has predominantly been an issue about class politics, actually, um, and about the, the, you know, the haves and the have-nots. Um, you know, Britain is a country that's never really had a revolutionary moment, um, so we haven't done what the French did. Um, and, well, it makes me feel we're not living in a modern country. No one's expecting a revolution. But landowners are under growing pressure from MPs. They've launched an investigation into whether landowners pay enough tax and deserve the agricultural subsidies they receive. The man leading that investigation isn't known for pulling his punches. We want to clarify whether or not the amount of money that big landowners, rich landowners get is justified whether or not they make a fair contribution by paying the, the um, complete amount of tax that they should, and see whether or not the balance is right. I think there's an extent to which the big landowners see themselves as being in Scotland, but not really of Scotland, I and mean, that they're above it all, that they don't really like the, the oiks or the rough 
coming along and asking questions. I mean, they're willing enough to take public money, but they're not really keen on having the public question the privileges and rights that they have. Landowners and farmers are no different to anyone else. They pay tax where tax is due in this country, but of course they have tax planning, much like you and I would do. Um, and that's normal and it's a good business practice. You're under intense scrutiny at the moment. The Parliamentary Select Committee are looking at this. You're going to lose this argument, aren't you? No, we're not. No, and you know, I'm all in favour of scrutiny because we've got a good and very positive story to tell, so bring it on. It was perhaps a little surprising to hear Doug being quite so relaxed about the possibility of wide-ranging changes to the tax system because if I was a big landowner, I'd know I have potentially a lot to lose. North, south, east, now west. There's one place I have to visit if I'm going to understand why this debate really matters. To hear how changes in land ownership can change the way people live their lives. That place is the Isle of Egg. It's almost 20 years now since the islanders made history and the headlines. In 1997, the island was owned by a German conceptual artist called Maruma. The islanders launched an appeal and bought him out. Today is a giant leap for Egg and its people and hopefully another small step towards the future of land ownership in Scotland. Thank you. It was a huge step for a tiny community, and as it proved for the whole country. That in part led the Scottish Government to legislate, giving communities across Scotland the right to buy and creating a fund to help them. Sarah Bowden left the island when she was just a child, and now she's back. I came back four years ago, um, and prior to that I was a music journalist on the Observer newspaper in London. Um, and now I farm this side of the island uh, with my parents. We took over the tenancy of my uncle's farm. Her partner Johnny has come with her. Bizarre as it may seem, he's busy running his own record label from a caravan on egg. Johnny and Sarah are just two of the young people who the buyout has brought to Egg. I came up here and fell in love with the, with the lady and, <laughs> and with the place, the island itself. It's going to be a Wendy house with a roof like that. <laughs> Next spring they'll build a house here. It's the community buyout which has made that possible. The trust which owns the island is providing the land they'll need. That would never have happened under, <laughs> under a Laird, definitely. So what does the future hold? Will you be starting a family here? Uh, <laughs> well, actually, I'm already six months gone. <laughs> uh, ho hopefully, yeah. And the thing <clears throat> that's, uh, there's much more younger people here that, um, who have started families, and it means that your kid's not going to be going to school with one other person, <laughs> which... Uh, so, yeah, it's probably. a definite priority for us, of which I'm reminded of most days. <laughs> yeah. So, big changes ahead for Johnny and Sarah, but life has also changed for the rest of the islanders. The buyout allowed them to build a renewable energy grid to power their homes. It doesn't generate millions of pounds in profits, but it does keep the lights on. Suddenly, you know, we've got 24-hour power, which is a huge amount of difference. Until they actually switched it on, they didn't know that it was going to work. <laughs> Literally, the electrical engineers are, mm, it might go, it, it might not. Anyway, it did. Uh, much to everybody's not surprised. <laughs> but, uh... This was the biggest project we tackled since the buyout, but fantastic, brilliant. The difference it's made to everybody. If you can imagine before, with a generator, you only used it for a few hours a day, really expensive, real hassle getting diesel here to the island. And suddenly, you know, we've got 24 hour power, which is a huge amount of difference. Could you have done this 
under another model of land ownership? I doubt it very much. That's all very well, but is egg really a template for other parts of Scotland? Is it a realistic alternative to large land holdings? There are those who would argue you're a bunch of old hippies doing this at the taxpayer's <laughs> expense. Are they wrong? <laughs> I mean, I might be one. <laughs> but there's a lot of people here who'd be very offended by that. <laughs> and we certainly don't... We don't use a lot of taxpayers' money, that's for sure. I mean, we bought egg. It, egg cost 1.5 million, and only 17,000 of that came from the public purse. The rest of it was by donations from the general public. There's a problem, though. Community buyout has largely run into the sand. A few highly motivated communities have done it, but is it really possible elsewhere? There's an estate on sale uh, in Angus, 5,000 acres, 29 million pounds. There's an estate in Argyle for sale, 11 million pounds. There's, there's a farm in Berwickshire for sale at eight and a half million pounds. The total fund in the Scottish Land Fund to buy land on behalf of communities is six for the whole of Scotland. So we've got to do something about land values to bring the value of land down to affordable prices, essentially to its economic value, strip out the whole of the speculative gain that people expect to make in the land market and return land to its economic value. And then you'll have all sorts of people, not just communities, I mean individuals. This is the big revolution, is to get many, many more individuals owning land. I set out to meet the men who own Scotland. That's what I've done, and they've told me they're doing a good job. Their message, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But no one's been able to explain to me how the system we've inherited is fair. <laughs> In just a few months' time, ministers will receive a report from a team of experts who are studying land reform. We're told to expect radical proposals proposals which could change Scotland forever. I'm confident that the Land Reform Review Group will come forward with radical proposals. That's what we've charged them to do, and um, I'm keen to see, see what they come forward with in April. But certainly my party genuinely believes that, that there should be a fair distribution of land, that communities should have access to land for, to fulfil their aspirations, and that's something I think we're, we're, we're setting out a vision as to what we want to achieve. And if, in decades to come, we still have a pattern of land ownership across Scotland, certainly rural Scotland, where our landscape is dominated by big traditional sporting estates, will that be a failure of government? I think if we don't see a fair distribution of land, then, then we're Parliament, we will have failed the people of Scotland. Ministers are being cautious. The process towards land reform is at a very sensitive stage. But it would be a mistake to forget that within the SNP there is a deep-seated desire to see change. Change is coming. We just don't know what form that change will take and I'm not sure the government does either. <laughs>